The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that may result from listening to this podcast. King's podcast. I'm Nathaniel Darkish. This is Max George, and we come not to reward, but to punish. This is episode seven. Seven. Woo! We did it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> other than just it being kind of an ambiguous number thrown out by people saying that that's when podcasts hit their stride, it, it doesn't really have that much significance. But hey. We assigned a lot of value to this. We've been talking about this for episodes. Yeah, I I mean, all the research I've done online about podcasting and how to have a successful podcast and blah, 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 all have mentioned that you want to hit like a seven episode stride. Once you hit that seven episodes, you're golden. So we're just going to become outrageously popular and can quit our jobs and just live off the podcast now. Yep. Not not at all like have to put our own money into posting fees or anything like that i mean i'm not going to mention anything like that no no or if anyone wants to sponsor us we're not going to mention that either because we hit our seventh episode yeah and and we're definitely not going to mention that that we can be reached at scream kings podcast at gmail.com nope not going to mention that okay anyway but yeah, we, we want to shout out to our listeners for all of the support that we've received so far. Thank you for bearing with us as we have gone through all of the awkward uh, first six episodes. And, and now it'll just be golden from here on. So just sit back and, and enjoy getting through those first six, I guess. And yeah, thank you for everyone who's listened, who's liked our Facebook page, who interacts with us on Twitter. I mean, we're all over the place. You search for Scream Kings on your social media websites and you're going to find us. And it's just been really fun. We've done some really cool things with the community now. You know, a few months ago, we went to uh, FearCon, which was really cool. And we, this last week, was it last week or two weeks ago? I don't even remember. Week and a half. We were able to do a live tweet in connection with Monsters Out of the Closet, another podcast in which I have voice acted for. And that was so much fun uh, to connect with other horror fans and just interact with each other it was such a good time i had a blast doing that i thought it was really funny it it was just a lot of fun to kind of do some mystery science theater-esque uh cracking wise and and then also you know getting to share some of my geeky obsessive film nerd information that i also have picked up about about the movie krampus which is our topic of the day so we live tweeted the entire show and it was really fun we both kind of picked out some things that we really liked we really didn't like and it was just a lot of fun and we have plans to do it again in the future so if you haven't followed us on twitter stop what you're doing right now go follow us on twitter and so, so read at through scream all kings tweets. pod at scream kings yes, pod and, and then also, also definitely sorry and and at nj darkish max was was manning the helm of the main twitter and then i was doing my personal one to contribute to it so and also follow monsters out of the closet they have about three episodes up and running now and their twitter handle is at pod underscore monsters without further ado though i think we should just jump right into this holiday treat of a horror movie guess just go over the the gist of the plot and then kind of dig into what really stuck out to us in in this delightful 2015 gem uh yeah for all of our listeners i want them to deeply understand that christmas is my favorite time of the year would you not agree nathaniel i i think that would be fair to say (laughs) and so a movie that incorporates both horror elements and the holiday elements is just it's such a fun movie if you haven't seen krampus you know even now that we're not in the holiday season definitely go and watch it it's a really fun show yeah, and I mean, it, it works really well as a holiday-themed movie. I mean, like there are actually some like lessons learned and, and stuff like that. But it's also just a pretty solid horror movie, no matter how you slice it. So, yeah, even if it isn't that time of year, it's still fun to pick up. I wanted to clarify that we were talking about the Krampus movie 
that yeah, came out, you know, 2015, directed by Michael Doherty, you know, starring Adam Scott, Tony Collette. That one, not one of the zillion other bad knockoffs that have popped up in the last couple of years. Yeah, it seemed like once this movie came out, the B movie industry just took over and went haywire with Krampus movies. There are so many atrocious Krampus B movies out there. This is the 2015 studio produced Krampus movie. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, like, the other ones might have something to offer. I, I don't necessarily want to knock them without having watched them, but they really were kind of riding on its coattails and trying to get people to rent them on Redbox by accident and that kind of thing, which is a shame, to say the least. So, And you know how I feel about B-movies. They're not my favorite things at all, so I'm a little biased. I'm going to convert you someday. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Okay, but so let's let's talk about the plot, um, and then yeah. Do you want to start us out? Sure. Um, so basically, what we're dealing with here is the story of a family uh, gathering together for Christmas, who have a lot of reasons to kind of argue and bicker with each other. And the the son in the uh, the family that's hosting, whose name is Max, which Max got a little bit too excited about. Because he totally was me growing up. This kid's like 14, maybe, and still writing to Santa. That was me. <laughs> That's fair. I, I, I believe that. And the same name, so... And the same name. That's everything. <laughs> Your name is totally unheard of. I've never met any other, or I've never seen any other characters with, with that name, so... It's fine. 80% of people with the name max are actually dogs so i have to celebrate when they're humans <laughs> that's fair i mean like the grinch is dogs. basically what what we're dealing with is max is writing this letter to santa and he is asking santa to help his family you know both immediate and kind of some extended family to have things kind of work out better you know that they can overcome marital problems and you know, stop fighting and that you know the his cousins and, and his aunt and uncle that, that, you know, they might be in a better financial situation, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it's a really heartfelt letter that he's written. And, you know, in the mid middle of all this bickering and fighting, one of his cousins, you know, snags his letter from Santa and reads it aloud. And it's this kind of big, awkward scene. And Max, you know, grabs his letter and he runs away and he tears it up and he throws it out his window. And you know, he's just fed up with christmas and fed up with his family and it's you know doesn't want this anymore and so he throws it all out the window and it gets sucked up into the sky and bad things start happening. yeah and so we learn a little bit later on in the movie from the sweet little german grandmama uh about this kind of the shadow of santa claus and this shadow of santa claus is actually based in historical fact there it's a european myth that santa claus comes around and delivers presents to all the good boys and girls but however he has this kind of dark shadowy side named krampus who people who misbehave they're gonna get whipped and beat and punished for their naughty you know naughty actions and naughty behavior which is a very... little bit more intense than coal <laughs> i was just gonna say i would much rather get a, a big block of coal than get whipped I don't know. Maybe you're into that. I mean, no judgment. You do you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm imagining erotic Krampus foreplay now. <laughs> <laughs> you just discovered a fetish you didn't know you had. Oh, what is happening to my body? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I apologize to all our listeners that you had to endure that. Um, Max and is... the Ghiblis that ensued. <laughs> yeah. Don't go looking on Tumblr for Krampus foreplay. <laughs> um, so Max's letter kind of gets sucked up into the sky, like you mentioned, Nathaniel. And then this crazy storm rolls in. And this is when kind of, you know, the proverbial shit hits the fan. That this weather kind of be makes this family stay inside. They can't leave anywhere because the weather is so bad. And then they start to notice the little spooky things. And one of the very first scares that it really does is Max wakes up the next morning and looks out the window and there's this creepy skeleton in the front yard that nobody created. And it's just kind of got this menacing, malicious stare at him. You mean snowman? What did I say? Skeleton. Oh, excuse me. I mean, I love skeletons, but I want to build a snowman. Do you want to build a snowman? Only if I can do it like Calvin and Hobbes style. 
<laughs> Did you catch my Frozen reference? What? Do you want to build a snowman? Yes, I caught it. <sighs> anyway, um, so yeah, so we have this, you know, creepy snowman outside, and then, like, the, this winter storm knocks out the power, they don't have cell signals, and of course the teenage girl, Max's older sister, you know, she has to leave, she has to go talk to her boyfriend, because she can't text him anymore, so she's the first to be exposed to some of the craziness that's going on so she goes out into this snowstorm not you know just only a few houses away but she doesn't come back they're just kind of waiting for her and waiting for her and waiting for her and no beth she's gone and so this is kind of where the plot really starts to thicken and we see krampus for the first time he summons his army of holiday minions that start terrorizing the family the fathers try and go and find this poor innocent girl who's lost in a snowstorm. They get attacked by Krampus, and it all just kind of snowballs, pun intended, into this hellish holiday nightmare where they're getting tormented and terrorized by these demonic holiday creatures. Not only are they getting attacked, but they're also in very cold weather in a cold house with no power. And if they go outside, they're going to get frostbite and probably get hypothermia and die. So they're stuck there. And that was a really cool element that you mentioned being one of your favorite parts about the movie is, you know, a lot of times in winter movies, and especially winter horror movies, they don't really use, you know, the climate or temperature, weather, whatever you want to call it, as a scare factor. But this movie, I think, does an excellent, excellent job at showing you the bitter death that is winter sometimes and you know this family wasn't stuck inside because of the minions they were stuck inside because they couldn't go outside mm -hmm. and and so then they had to deal with the minions when they encountered them i love like you said that 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 it really kind of showed why winter is scary i often express great feelings of hatred towards the winter time of year uh, because so I, I. I, I hate snow, I hate ice, I hate slush, I hate all of these things. And, and, I mean, who hasn't been in a car that slid onto black ice? That's terrifying. So maybe let's move into that and kind of talk about our respective favorite parts about this movie. You know, we gave a very big, superficial kind of overview of the plot. Um, and we'll get to the ending and kind of how this movie wraps up a little bit later in the podcast. Because it's a very cool... Um, I don't cool is not the right word. It's a very twisted kind of an ending mm -hmm. if you think that would be the right word. Uh, and so we want to kind of hone in on that specifically. And so uh, Nathaniel, kind of go over what are some more of your favorite parts? Well, one thing I really liked about it is how it dealt with music. One it, it, so it did a, great. Yeah, it did a good job of you know incorporating uh, Christmas songs in kind of perverse ways. Sometimes it would play like a well-known Christmas song during something awful happening and it kind of was a twisted contrast that that really brought forward a lot of the humor of the film too because it's not just a straight horror film it's definitely a comedy as well but i so i enjoyed when they did that and also just the the overlaying score is very good and i found this on imdb that the composer specifically was trying to take classic christmas carols and incorporate a lot of pagan elements into it which is awesome yeah, and so, you know, in, in addition to just hearing kind of Christmassy, typical, you know, bells tinkling and that kind of thing, there's also chains and animal skin drums and, like, skulls and all sorts of, like, really interesting choices for instruments. And and I love that, that it really elevates the, the movie and the, and the creep factor in a lot of ways. And also is, is used, like I said before, uh, to also heighten the humor. Yeah, the music throughout the entire movie is just so well used and so well placed you know it's this cheery happy you know christmas song that everyone's familiar with and associates with you know jolly old saint nicholas but they twist it in a way and use it at moments where it kind of scares you just the music yeah and being a person who generally has a great dislike of christmas music the fact that i actually was really impressed with its use of christmas music really does say a lot about it Yes, you do hate Christmas music. So much. Why does that one time of year have music, but the rest of the year it has it's just, you know, whatever. It's dumb. Because it's the most wonderful time of the year, Nathaniel. That's dumb. Anyway. 
<laughs> um, talk to us about puppetry. You're huge uh, into puppetry. So I am a huge, 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 huge fan of practical effects. I mean, I'm sure you probably remember me just gushing over how much I love the you know practical work in like Alien, for example. So this movie didn't solely use practical effects. It definitely used some. Uh, CGI, especially for like the gingerbread men uh, who attack them. But some of the more interesting minions are some demonic toys, basically. And they are all practical puppets, and I- I'm really impressed with them. Um, particularly a really creepy, like, bride doll kind of thing. She's freaky, and when she opens her mouth and it has, like, two tongues, like, whipping out, oh, it's, yeah, it's that gross. It's super gross. Ugh. It's gross in, in like, the best way. The tongue. Something about the tongue is just always revolting. Definitely, like, it adds a lot. It's almost like a little, like, mini sarlacc fit on her face. <laughs> um, it's also really cool. Krampus is not CGI himself. Yeah, he's he is a giant practical effect. I mean, he they, I'm understand it took a, a fair number of puppeteers to make him work and move because he's huge and very scary and... I, I love how he looks. I love how he moves. And the fact that that's all achieved with practical puppetry is phenomenal. For me, probably my favorite parts of this movie were kind of the subtle scares that it likes to do. The snowman was kind of the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as you continue watching the movie, the family, when they start noticing these minions of Krampus, they're looking outside the window and they see just these like glowing lights in the bushes that are supposed to be glowing eyes. And I don't know about you, but glowing eyes will always kind of creep me out in darkness. I was backing up my car the other day. I saw a cat have, like, the red light of the car reflected in its eyes just because it was, you know, behind the car. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, it was that demon we summoned in the Necromicon episode. You mean Necronomicon? Learn how to say your words, Max. I cannot talk today. I apologize, everyone. It is 9.45 and it's... Two hours past my bed. That's fair. I, I I also apologize for all of my inability to articulate myself. I put all of that into a, a teaching job interview earlier, so... Woohoo! Yeah, so fingers crossed there. In addition to just the glowing eyes, I mean, it's one thing to see glowing eyes, but how the elements in this movie, the winter elements, um, you know, they say these eyes in this blizzard, and they're not sure what's going on. Are they seeing something? Is it just the blizzard? And that is just brilliant. And then there's also a scene where you see Krampus just kind of looming on a roof, kind of almost vampire-esque. And that's just, it's such a beautiful horror scene because you have, this is like the first time you've seen a full body Krampus and he's just massive. And he's got these huge demonic horns coming out of him and the blizzard's going on. And it's, it's just one of those things where you're out in the dark, you're all alone and you're scared. And you're always kind of looking over your shoulder, looking over your shoulder, you know, thinking that you might have seen something. And this scene is one of those, oh my gosh, I'm actually seeing something. And it's giant and it's demonic. Yes. I mean, and so for me, kind of my favorite part about this whole movie are those little subtle, just artistic horror scares that are very well executed and make this movie... Not only a fun horror movie, but a good horror movie in itself. I definitely agree. I guess I wanted to bring up one other thing that I really love about this movie, and it's that it's chock full of horror references and also uh, Christmas movie references. Oh, absolutely. Which I think is a lot of fun. A lot of the houses that you see uh, featured in the film that are not the main family's house are are from other movies. Like they, they have the Bates house from Psycho. They have the Amityville house, they have uh, the Home Alone house, or, yeah, Home Alone house. Um, they have a ton of different houses that are either from horror movies or Christmas movies, and that's awesome. That is very cool. I love it when horror movies kind of bleed into other horror movies. You know, we've mentioned that you see a lot of that in the Evil Dead franchise, and I, I love it when you see it in other other movies like this one. I and mean, it's also something that we love about Stranger Things. Like, I love when filmmakers or writers or whoever and to take the chance to tip the hat and you kind of wink at, at the audience and, and say, hey, like, this is, you know, what I was inspired by. It's awesome. You should also check that out. Because, I mean, that's that's a great way to discover more great things. So let's move into our least favorite parts about this movie. 
Yes. And do you want to go, or would you like me to start? Uh, you start this time. Uh, there are a few things. It's definitely not a perfect horror movie, and I feel like we've both become horror snobs, and so when we see a horror movie, we always try and find something to critique at least. Yeah, and I will say that it is easier to critique things in this movie than a lot of the other ones that we've dealt with, so... I would agree. For me, the biggest issue I have is I thought that there was so much horror and so much scare potential in just Krampus himself and these little moments of spooky eyes in the foliage and this creepy snowman who seems to be getting closer and these kind of subtle scares that were working really, really well. And then all of the sudden, all of these Christmas minions, the gingerbread men, the -the jack-in-the-box slug thing and even the the forked tongue angel whatever i mean the puppetry was amazing don't get me wrong the puppetry was awesome but it it just it kind of made the movie fall apart for me a little it's like when in a demon possession movie they show you the demon right off the bat and once you see it it's not scary anymore so in this case it's almost the opposite of that though where it's they they tease out this you know big villain and then they don't really give him to you until the very end right and then they kind of undermine his authority with all these crazy you know almost nightmare before christmas uh puppetry which again is amazing but it just felt disjointed for me and it kind of felt like it took away from the demonic presence of krampus himself i i agree to an extent but i really really like the minions and i like what they did and in you know not only I mean, to me, what worked for this movie wasn't that it just took Santa Claus and kind of made, you know, put put that on its head, but it also took a lot of other things that have become staples of Christmas. Uh, the cookies and the toys and all of that stuff, and also put all of that as part of the threat. So I, I really like their inclusion, but I would have liked more problems. And I I can agree with that. You know, I understand where they were coming from and why they kind of did that. And like you mentioned, it's not just Santa Claus that they were turning upside down. It was the whole kind of idea of Christmas that they were turning upside down. I just wish it kind of meshed a little bit more with what was going on with Krampus and how, like, these subordinates... I don't know. It just kind of felt like they came out of nowhere and then they caused a ruckus and then... The end of the movie happened. And that kind of is one of your parts that you had struggled with was timing. Yeah, I feel like the start of the movie, it took a long time to kind of get going, which I wouldn't have minded so much if we had really strong characters. But the characters are kind of just like cartoonishly stereotypical. And that's another issue that I had is that these people, you know, I, I get that they were kind of doing an homage to the classic Christmas movies, you know. Uh, Christmas Vacation or Christmas Story or, you know, whatever holiday movie you enjoy, you know, you've got the uncle who's a deadbeat who's obnoxious and brings his kids and you've got the uptight family and the in-laws that are annoying. It took those kind of holiday stereotypes and shoved it down your throat relentlessly. And, like, I don't mind that that is what they decided to do with the film, but we don't need, like, 30 minutes of introduction of these characters if that's who they're going to be. And that's what I'm trying to say. Like, it, they, it just, it was over the top, in your face kind of stereotype types. Yeah, and also, like, it, it seems like they were trying to suggest that these characters, like, underwent some sort of growth as people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they really didn't. It, so, it, I, I don't know. It just, it was weird that it spent, you know, this much time showing kind of how awful they were. When I'm supposed to be kind of cheering for them fighting these monsters and fighting, you know, this demonic Krampus. And... I kind of didn't care when they got taken out one by one or, you know, in fact, there was a few of the characters I was downright happy that they got defeated, so. Right, I was the same way because then we didn't have to watch them again on screen and being obnoxious and annoying, whatever. And so, like, yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with the, the choice to make them that cartoonishly stereotypical because I felt like it worked for also, you know, kind of playing with what the the norm is for a christmas movie the problem is just is is acting like they were characters that deserve that much time and attention uh, in terms of like character development when there really wasn't any it was just hey it's this stereotype and let's continue to show you the stereotype and oh now they're getting attacked after 30 minutes of waiting 
Yeah. Um, and then to kind of end this segment of our least favorite parts, I, I struggled with kind of towards the ending where Max finally approaches Krampus and it's this huge, almost bacchanalian ritual that is going on and you have no bloody idea what's happening. Uh, Krampus is holding some ritual where he's throwing kids in this pit and it just, again, it kind of felt disjointed. It, it made Krampus almost cheesy to me that, uh, I don't know, I don't know. I wish he would have been much more sinister in how they approached him and much more demonic and kind of ominous instead of almost over the top in his presence. It did a good job of making him so like like he was he was kind of like the creepy overlord for so long but you wanted to have the confrontation with him be something more impressive yeah it felt almost cheesy yeah like like there's a lot of like awe and pageantry to it but it was ultimately like missing okay like, how was he going to punish them he just opened a pit to hell and just started trying to chuck them in well and i i think another issue that i had with it is that the whole movie spent so much time documenting the horrors of winter time and then this very last scene he opens a pit and it's fire and brimstone and it it almost i think would have been more sinister if you know he froze them to death i mean he the whole movie is about the terror of winter time and oh, we're just going to throw him into a hot pit and kind of defeats the whole purpose of frostbite and freezing to death and, and kind of that theme. I don't know. I just, I struggled with it. They, they really could have made it be a creepy hell pit still, but it could have been, yeah, icy and instead of fiery. That would have worked for me. I mean, and going back to our last podcast in Dante's Inferno, when you meet Lucifer himself, it's not on a, a throne of fire. He's sitting on a frozen lake. And so, you know, including that into this imagery and symbolism would have been really cool. But it just, I don't know, it fell apart. Yeah, they kind of missed the mark on that. Anything else that was really scary to you in this movie? Little moments. Like, for example, there's there's a scene when most of the family's kind of been whittled down in, in different ways. And Max and at least one of his cousins are, like, hiding in this truck and... They, you know, are trying to like get it started, trying to get away from the situation, but they can't get it going. And and the Kromp, you know, and, and Krampus and his minions are, uh, his like, especially I think it was his evil elves are like right there, like assaulting them. That was pretty creepy. One of my other favorite spookiest parts was when Beth leaves the house to go see her boyfriend in this blizzard, and Krampus starts stalking her, and she hides beneath uh, a truck, I believe. Yeah. And there's this little music box, or not a music box, excuse me, a jack in the box. And, you know, that classic kind of a thing. And, and that, again, it was just a, kind of that subtle, what's going on? You know, you start getting tense, and then Krampus drops his chain. And that's really all we know. I really liked that part, and I really enjoyed the scare. And, and I really like that, for the most part, you know, as these characters start getting picked off, especially in the beginning, you have no idea what like what is happening to them like where are they going what what is he doing to them when he gets them so let's move on into the ending something that i will say i the first time i watched krampus i didn't enjoy the ending second time i watched krampus my mind was blown <laughs> so i i absolutely adore this ending um do you want to go over what happens okay so once Max gets thrown into this weird, fiery pit, he wakes up, and it's Christmas morning. He looks outside, weather's improved, the, the power's back on, and, you know, he can hear people downstairs. He, he, you know, runs downstairs in his pajamas, and the family is all gathered around the Christmas tree, and they're you know, about to start opening presents. And it's just this, you know, very picturesque scene that, you know, like how a lot of Christmas movies end. And they're exchanging gifts and everyone is like a warm, happy family and bonded with each other. And no one's talking about this Krampus thing that happened. And so you kind of start questioning, okay, was this all a dream? And then Max gets a present that's it's unclear as to who it came from. And I'll let you explain the significance of it. Yeah, so this is... The second time I watched this, this is where my mind was blown. 
Um, so he opens this present, and it's a bell that he received from Krampus. And it's this old, kind of grungy-looking bell. And then he has this realization, like, oh my gosh. And then the camera starts to zoom out, and it shows that this whole kind of situation that is going on this Christmas morning that Max is having is taking place in this snow globe that is residing in Krampus's lair dungeon, whatever you want to call it. And there's thousands, hundreds and thousands of other snow globes going on. So it's kind of like this realization, like, Oh my gosh, Krampus won. He enslaved them in this Christmas hell for all time and eternity. Yeah. And, and basically once they're imprisoned in the snow globe, they're each other's hell like exactly i loved that the bell was a kind of a well one a a reference to the polar express which is something that you told me about and that made things really click for me in a lot of ways yeah so let me kind of dive into that real quick um so for any of our listeners who've seen polar express it's a great movie uh there's an excellent josh groban song in it and really Uh. bad cgi yeah, the CGI is not the, the best, but, you know, it's a Christmas movie, so, you know, you put that aside. <laughs> um, Tom Hanks is in it. He plays a lot of the characters. Anyway, at the end of the movie, the main boy who goes on the Polar Express meets Santa Claus. Uh, Santa Claus gives him a bell from one of his reindeer as kind of a gift. And kind of a similar situation happens in the Polar Express. He wakes up Christmas morning. And his whole adventure on the Polar Express, meeting Santa Claus, and all of that seems like it was a dream. He goes downstairs, he has Christmas morning with his parents, they open all their gifts, and there's one gift left for him. He opens it up, and it just so happens to be the very same bell that Santa gave him. And he realizes, like, oh, yay, the magic of Christmas is real, and Santa exists, and happy holidays, and blah, 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 blah. So it's like a perversion of that which is awesome exactly and that's when my mind was blown i was like oh my heavens this is the dark twisted upside down version of polar express this is what happens in the demogorgon and the mind flayer world (laughs) oh it was beautiful so i just barely had that explained to me um just before we started recording so that just adds to my love of this ending but i already had this like unabashed love for it because one, also the bell has significance in that uh, his grandmother, you know, the, the German grandmother, also had a bell because a part of her backstory is that she actually kind of went through a similar thing. And she was the lone survivor in her family after Krampus came previously. So so there's that. Um, and she has, you know, that same bell. And Which kind of makes me think, if she got that bell, does that mean she was living in a Krampus hell? That's something that might be a little bit of a plot inconsistency. Though, actually, I do want to just briefly, you know, ignore the fact that it might be a plot inconsistency and, and bring up just the, the brief fact that the section where it kind of goes into the grandma's origin story, you know, with, with her as a child. I love the, the stop motion uh, animation that they did for that. Oh, it was beautiful. It was, it was beautiful, and it was also a fun throwback to a lot of other Christmas movies. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, or Year Without a Santa Claus, those kind of claymation almost type of movies. It's, it was gorgeous. The bell comes into it, and I love that, yeah, that they're still trapped in this hell, and it's, yeah, this hell of their own making, and, you know, some of the snow globes are also other different horror houses, which is a lot of fun, but it's, I don't know, it just, it feels so perfect to have this kind of, like, despair kind of fill, fill that scene, and, and, yeah, like, when he holds up the bell and he's staring at it, also has a, a brief moment where it kind of shows everyone else in the room, and it shows like the look in their eyes and kind of like they start, start realizing too. And then it pans out. And I love that. It just kind of ends just before they like go like, oh my gosh, this is like everything has gone wrong. So I adore that ending. Like that is a killer ending to a really solid horror movie. And I, I love it when movies don't have happy endings. You know, life sucks sometimes, and we don't always get a perfect happy ending. And I love it when movies aren't afraid to express that. And that was this kind of an ending that, you know, it, it, it didn't turn out happy. They are stuck in an eternal snow globe hell, and that's it. And I love that. <laughs> There's just something poignant about that. And I felt like the ending was earned. That that was what 
it was all about. Like, they were each other's problem. And, you know, the, the problem wasn't the holiday. The problem wasn't, you know, the Christmas or the cookies or whatever. The problem was each other. And so the fact that it ends with, you know, them kind of, yeah, being stuck, being punished by each other. Awesome. I love it. As part of our seventh episode, I kind of suggested that we do something new with the movies that we review. And that is something that I wanted to implement into this podcast specifically. And that's what we are calling Screams and Crowns. Uh, We're going to rate the movie on its scare factor and how well it is a scary movie if it scares you if it terrifies you frightens you whatever you want to call it and then we're also going to give it some crowns meaning is it a solid movie is it a good movie stuff like that um do you want to go into the screams first and kind of talk about where you would rate it on a scale of one being not scary at all and 10 being terrifying keeping you up at night okay yes i personally would rate it a four because even though the scares are are well constructed, ultimately, like they don't really get under my skin. I I can appreciate them. Um, you know, I, I can watch the movie and say like, oh, like I understand like why that was like technically a, a well constructed scare moment. But they didn't just I don't know they just didn't quite scare me personally. So I, I give it four. Um, and it's hard to earn screams from me because honestly, there aren't that many movies that have really like. Got some. I'm the same way, and I, I'm gonna give it five screams just because it takes a lot to scare me. But I think an average person watching this movie, there would be some parts that would be a little unnerving. But again, I, it takes a lot to scare me. I've been desensitized quite a bit. But I think it, it was a good. It's a horror movie, and you know it's a horror movie when you watch it. But it doesn't, it doesn't stick with you like Evil Dead does, or you know, The Exorcist, those kind of movies stick with you. And that's what I really judge a, a good scary movie on, is if it makes me look across my shoulder at night. Yeah, and, and I mean, to be fair, I don't think they were going for it being absolutely terrifying. I mean, it's PG-13. Nor do I. Right. And, and I know that that was actually like a big caveat of the studio when they agreed to make it, was that it had to be PG-13 because a lot of other horror movies you know that are kind of around christmas time have been relatively less successful and especially since it was such a big studio release and i believe it was universal they they wanted to make some good money off of it and so pg-13 is going to you know be the kind of the sweet spot for making the most money so they they had to tone certain things down for that reason and also i mean it was a horror comedy and so a lot of it is designed to be funny even while it's scaring you Saying it's four or five doesn't really like put it down. I don't think that was their intention to have it be a hyper intense, horrifying movie. So there's that. Okay, now let's talk crowns. Yeah, so crowns, we want to just an overall movie. How well did it perform as a movie itself? Crowns, you know, is it an A plus movie or is it an F kind of a thing? So again, on a scale of one, just being an absolutely terrible movie like the Emoji movie. And 10 being an amazing, wonderful, beautiful movie, like I would say Silence of the Lambs. Yes, I would definitely say, you know, put a good number of the movies that we've covered at that 10 crown level. I mean, that, uh, you know, Silence of the Lambs or Alien, easily a 10 crown movie for me. Also, 9 or 10s in terms of the screams for me. But for this movie, I, I put it at a solid 7. And I agree, 7 is what I rated it as well. It's, it's a very well-done movie. I mean, we've talked about all of the layers in terms of its presentation, its, you know, the, the great effects, the having multiple types of presentation, you know, with, with the stop-motion section and all of that. It's, it's very well done. The actors did a good job, even though, I mean, they were playing cartoonishly stereotypical characters. You know, I, I enjoyed Adam Scott in it. Uh, which That's is because he's for, your spirit animal. Yeah, at least you know his his character in Parks and Rec is totally my spirit animal. <laughs> you say expect a Patronum, and Ben Scott comes out. Adam Scott comes out. Excuse me, Ben from yes Parks, Parks and Rec. Rec. Yeah, and so I I I really enjoyed uh, seeing him in something that I actually like again. This is most recent project. Ghosted is the worst. <laughs> yeah, I haven't even seen it yet. Don't do it. It's so bad. It's like X Files if X Files was written for and by dumb people. <laughs> Ugh, 
so bad. Anyway. So 4.5 for screens if we kind of average your and my score. And seven crowns. So overall, a, a really solid movie. Yeah, I would say so. Not terrifying. So, you know, it's not going to keep you up at night, but it will still kind of spook you a little bit. And overall, a fun, enjoyable movie. Yeah, like really, if you want to have a movie that you can laugh at and just have a good time, like I think this is a great movie for like a party for for people who who maybe like Christmas, but are a little bit irreverent. Or if you like horror movies, but you don't like the extreme rated R demon possession kind of chaotic movies, you know, it's a good horror movie for the family we could say (laughs) yeah as long as your family is you know a little bit more intense than mine (laughs) being raised by the scream kings (laughs) yeah oh yeah it'll be a staple in my household so anything else you wanted to talk about krampus before i move into my occult corner um no i think that covers it uh the occult corner tonight is going to be pretty simple uh, we wanted to make this podcast a little bit more focused on the movie that we reviewed, especially where we added in kind of the screams and crowns. We don't want to overload you guys listening. Uh, and so for the occult corner today, I kind of wanted to talk about the origins of Christmas. You know, I could go on and on about the Krampus mythos, which is really fun. But again, I kind of like my occult corners to be related to the movie in a way that kind of goes through the back door. Adjacent, but not directly just diving into more of the same exactly um and so i was researching kind of the history of christmas itself and christmas is kind of a shortened down version of christ's mass uh and as i'm sure most of our listeners know christmas is a christian holiday which celebrates the birth of jesus christ however um there are a lot of traditions and a lot of uh, what's the word i'm looking for a lot of symbolism to other earlier religions, um, primarily paganism, that celebrated festivals that have traditions that m- almost mirror what we do now for Christmas. And primarily, one of those is known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a Roman holiday worshipping their agricultural deity, Saturn, uh, who was said to have reigned over the world in the Golden Age. And so every year they would have this huge festival worshiping this very important deity, uh, obviously because of agriculture. Back then, agriculture was economy, and it was a very, very big deal. And Saturnalia, you're going to hear a lot in kind of nerdy, goofy uh, shows and movies. I know it's a big thing in the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. It's, It's quite well known that a lot of the Christmas traditions come from this kind of Roman holiday. Something really interesting that I like about Saturnalia was one of their biggest traditions that the Romans would do was it was a festival of light and kind of new beginning. It was at the end of the year in December and they were kind of bringing in the new year and they would light a lot of candles and put them in trees, obviously, which mirrors the traditional Christmas tree that we have now. And another big thing that they would do for Saturnalia was gift giving, especially amongst children. And even more so, the slaves in the community on Saturnalia were actually treated as equals to their masters, which I thought was really interesting. And so Christmas has always kind of been this holiday of acceptance and equality and just coming together as a family whether it's, you know, blood family or if it's your servants who serve you day in, day night, who are practically an extension of your family, everyone comes together, they have this huge feast, and presents are exchanged, especially amongst children, and everyone just kind of takes a day off and enjoys each other's company. I thought that was really cool to, to read about, about Saturnalia. Are there any creepy things about Saturnalia? Uh, You know, I didn't really pull up a lot of creepy things. I tried to focus on the happy times. Um, Do you know something creepy about Saturnalia? (laughs) No, I just thought that maybe we'd get into something creepy, too, just because, you know, we're the Scream Kings. It's true. Well, happy holidays, everyone, in January. 
uh, let's just briefly hang a lantern on the fact that, yeah, we're doing this in January. <laughs> it's yes. the 17th when we're recording. Um, it's our, our hashtag was Krampus comes late when we were doing the live tweet. And <laughs> this episode really is leaning into that. <laughs> Very much so. It's been quite the month for us both. I also just wanted to mention that um, when kind of the Christianity movement started to get really going and Constantine kind of merged all the land and became, you know, Christianity became the political religion of the area, a lot of these pagan traditions had to be merged into the new Christian traditions. And so that's why we see a lot of uh, pagan traditions in Christian holidays, and Christmas is probably one of the best examples of this. And it's gotten to the point where there are some Protestant sects who think it's too pagan and actually goes against the Bible, and so they do not practice Christmas at all. Um, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses are very against Christmas because of all of these underlying pagan roots associated with it. Really interesting to see kind of how holidays develop and, and you know that that we go from this you know saturnalia and then to incorporating the birth of christ into all of it and then you know this sainted man and then it then we introduce this demon who punishes bad kids so it's 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 weird to, to watch how these things all kind of evolve and take their own life over time so and for me someone who loves the occult it's so fun to see all of these occult and pagan traditions that have basically become merged into modern society, you know? There was a lot of destruction of pagan heritage and pagan culture during those times, you know, the, the Dark Ages where you know, paganism and witchcraft and all of that was very taboo and very evil. And a lot of that culture was destroyed, but in the same way, it wasn't so much destroyed as it was disguised and incorporated in different ways. And so I love kind of teasing that out and finding those little tidbits of paganism that have thrived and existed to today. That's really cool. That is all we really had for this episode. Do you have anything else you want to talk about on Krampus, on Saturnalia, on My Love of Christmas? Do you want to share with us your favorite Christmas song? I don't really have much of a favorite Christmas song because Christmas songs are the worst. Uh, you're the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I, again, just wanted to thank Monsters Out of the Closet, this amazing horror podcast, for joining up with us and doing such a fun live tweet. If you want to kind of go through the crazy tweets that we exchanged, it's really quite fun to look at everything that was said during the course of the movie. They've been an awesome supporter of our blog, and I just want to give them a shout out. Find them on the tweeter at pod underscore monsters, and definitely check us out as well. We would love to interact with you guys. Did you say that we're a blog? We're a podcast, man. Oh my gosh, I need to go to bed. Also, our next episode, we are thinking about doing a two-parter movie review, Creep and Creep 2. We just watched the sequel a few weeks ago. And I actually work with someone who is also a huge horror aficionado. So we are hoping to have our first podcast episode that features a guest. Yeah, so I think that'll be a lot of fun. So yeah, look forward to that. We might be going uh, undergoing some changes as far as like hosting and all of that as well. We might actually have a web page fairly soon. So uh, keep your eyes open. We'll announce stuff on Twitter as, as we have more developments. But yeah, thank you for listening and late happy holidays to you or i guess creepy holidays he sees you when you're sleeping he knows when you're awake he knows if you've been bad or good so be good for goodness sake or you'll be beaten with whips